Thank you, Jim. Um, not your regular air hostess. Um, and having uh, geared you all up this morning to laugh, I'll try and figure out what the laughs mean as I speak. Um, this, today's all about uh, ideas, it's all about the future. So I want to welcome you and start off today by going back in time 100, 1, million, 1, 1, 1 million years back into the past. That's what archaeologists know how to do, so bear with me as I try and introduce you to the future of ideas, which is what TEDx is all about today, by going back in time and looking at ideas and looking at innovation uh, from an archaeologist's point of view. So let's uh, start off and let's go back a million years, uh, first of all, to this object here. Uh, how many of you are familiar with that? Yes? Something that you know about? I can't see you, by the way, so if you put your hands up, it doesn't mean anything to me because all I can see is these lights in my eyes. So maybe uh, following on what Jim said, could I have a sort of uh, a sound response to that? Yes? Yes? Good. Thank you. That's really good because you're an archaeologically literate uh, audience, which is unusual. This is what we call a hand axe. This is one of the most amazing ideas of all time. Um, uh, it started more than a million years ago. We owe it to our direct ancestors, the Australopithecines. Now, I'm not going to do my Australopithecus uh, imitation in front of 1,500 people. I save that uh, for small groups of understanding students. Um, but imagine somebody around about this high, a little bit stooped, receding forehead, receding chin, lots of stubble, um, and a big nose sticking out in front, the sort of person that you routinely see on the London Underground. Right, so that basically is our Australopithecine ancestor. Now, the Australopithecines were very, very bright individuals. Um, and they made this critical leap with the wonderful idea of forming uh, the world's first uh, utility tool. And this is the hand axe. And they come in all shapes and sizes. And the extraordinary thing is they come from all across the world. We find them in India. We find them in Africa. We find them in Europe. We find them here in Lancashire. Um, and they date back a very long time into the past. And the point about them is that they're the first time that the human hand has been, ex has been uh, extended by an object. And you can see there uh, the way that it's designed. Uh, it will be grasped as a pointed tool. And we know that it's used uh, for anything, uh, from cutting up the carcass uh, of a, uh, a mammoth. And we've got some pretty good examples of mammoths that got themselves stuck in the ice and frozen uh, back in time. Uh, right the way through to digging up roots in Africa. It's a utilitarian tool. The crucial thing about it, though, is not so much that it is a tool. The crucial thing about it is that these were people who, for the first time, could pass ideas on to the next generation. And they had to have done that uh, through learning and teaching. So Australopithecines are the world's first teachers. They're the first people who pass knowledge on to the next generation. And that is what differentiates us from animals. Lots of animals make tools, birds make tools, ants make tools. The point about human beings is they pass ideas on to the next generation. So that's my time point a million years ago. Let's go forward. Us archaeologists deal with 10,000 years at a time without blinking an eyelid, by the way. That's what we do in archaeology. So let's go forward now to 100,000 years ago. Now, 100,000 years ago, uh, in terms of our anatomy, we begin to see the emergence of people who what we call are anatomically modern. In other words, they look like us, they think like us, they have brains that are basically structured like our brains, they walk upright, and they do things uh, that we recognize as human. And we would have no trouble. Were we to uh, encounter an early member of our own species, Homo sapiens, 100,000 years ago, we would have no difficulty in recognizing them as a human being. We might not be able to communicate with them, we wouldn't understand their language, but they would have language, they would be people, very clearly people. So 100,000 years ago, we get the evidence of the first anatomically modern people. Where do they come from? They come from Africa. They come from Southern Africa. All of the evidence, uh, convincing evidence, for the origin of our own species is Southern Africa. So here's good news for all of you. We are all Africans. Every one of you here is an African. In fact, every one of you here is probably a South African. Did you know that? So there you are. If you trace your DNA right back, there's a South African in every single one of you. So you're all kind of related to me. Um, so congratulations. So 100,000 years ago, uh, we get uh, what we recognize as modern people. Now, how do we know that? Again, it's ideas. It's the ideas that define it. 
And we've got lots of evidence for this, uh, but one of the most convincing sources of evidence for this is the record of art. We have the most extraordinary record of early art. It stretches again across huge parts of the world. Many of you, of course, will be familiar with the Paleolithic art uh, of Europe, of Spain, of France, of parts of Britain. Very important art record. The caves of Lastaux, for example, well known, quite rightly so. But that art tradition is also far wider. The picture that I've put up here uh, is in fact from the Drakensberg in southern Africa. In southern Africa, we have the first signs of art that we've dated back to about 50 or 60,000 years ago. And certainly, um, by 10 to 15,000 years ago, we have a wonderfully rich art tradition. This is a tradition we still don't understand. And the picture behind me here is showing you a very complicated scene, uh, which we, we know relates to a deep and complex mythology. We're only beginning to interpret how early people saw their world, thought their world, what their sets of ideas were, what their ideas, how those complex ideas expressed their belief, their relationship with each other. Early people were complicated. They weren't primitive. They weren't simple. They were thinking about the world in complex ways that we still don't understand. So they are ideas again. Forward 10,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, we get this extraordinary change across the world where farming is developed simultaneously in different parts on different continents. So over in middle America, people move away from ga gathering and hunting uh, and they begin to cultivate crops like maize, for example. And through our archaeological record, we can track uh, how maize cobs evolve through time and get gradually bigger and bigger. In the Middle East, center of farming development, barley, wheat, the sorts of staple cereals that we all depend on today are cultivated uh, for the first time um, across the Middle East in countries like Iraq, for example, the center of much of our early European settled life. Also in parts of Africa, farming developed independently. It all happens around the same sort of time. There is absolutely no evidence that that uh, spreads across the world in a sort of diffusion sort of way. People are inventing things simultaneously in different parts of the world. And again, what's the idea behind it? The idea is critical. What they're doing for the first time is selecting nature. They're interfering in nature. They are breeding crops. They are breeding uh, animals in order to serve our needs uh, as humans. So what you're beginning to see with farming is the emergence of people dominating nature. Now you can have your own views about that, of course, and we live in a world of ecological crisis. But believe me, you would not want to go back to hunter-gathering en masse, and I wish you luck if you choose that as a future. We depend on farming. We depend critically um, on crops and animals for our survival. So again, critical ideas invented across the world. A thousand years ago, well, what's happening a thousand years ago, across the world, people are living in cities. Um, again, the first cities, two to 3,000 BC, and again, in very different parts of the world. Clearly, some of the first cities are in the Middle East, but they're elsewhere as well. I was recently in Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka has one of the most amazing uh, traditions of city life in the world. More than 2,000 years of uninterrupted uh, history, people coming together, living in complex societies, living in cities. So across the world, a thousand years ago, people are moving into cities and living in cities. Again, urban life requires ideas. It requires change. It requires innovation. It requires new ways of living. People are thinking things through differently. They're working out how to organize themselves differently. Again, huge consequences. Many of those consequences are complicated. Many of those consequences are an imposition on subsequent generations. Very soon across the Southern Hemisphere, we will have people living in cities with more than 20 million people. I um, mean, cities like Mumbai, for example, in cities like Lagos. Um, these are places that are gonna become huge over the next 10 to 15 years, posing huge challenges for us about urban life. But their origin goes back over a thousand years ago, and their origin lies in the ideas and innovation that drove that forward. A hundred years ago, well, let's get right here to Salford. And here, of course, is one of L.S. Lowry's definitive pictures, the paintings that gives the names to this Lowry Center that we're in today. A hundred years ago, the, the Industrial Revolution. A hundred years ago, the ideas that drove uh, the industrial world forward. In the 19th century, three quarters of the whole of Britain's GDP was generated up here in the northwest of England. Three quarters. 
At that time, Manchester was London. London was nothing. This was a time of real innovation, real driving force. We saw that in Danny Boyle's wonderful celebration of the Olympics this summer, where, to the bemusement of the rest of the world, I think, he, uh, he, he created um, a uh, wonderful evocation of what the 19th century was like. Of course, huge challenges, uh, huge difficulties. This was the city that Frederick Engels came to in 1842, at the age of 22. And he came here to Salford in order to learn the trade uh, working in his father's mill in Salford. This was the time of child labor. This was the time of acute poverty. It was also the time of huge innovation, a time of ideas. Some of the social challenges that we still face today originate within that particular context at that time. So again, what we're seeing here is ideas that really drive forward innovation, really drive forward economic progress. Let's do a little bit of an up Salford moment here um, because we've got a huge amount to be proud of in the city of Salford. For example, Peel Park, where my university campus is, world's first public park. The library and museum in Salford, world's first public library. The Crescent, where my office is, the first street in the world to be lit by gas. Emmeline Pankhurst, Salford, women's suffragettes. Huge innovation, huge drive coming out of the city, but with all the challenges that are caught in Lowry's wonderful pictures of urban life, of city life, of factories, of the Industrial Revolution, but a time driven overwhelmingly by ideas and innovation. Ten years ago, now believe it or not, and you probably don't believe it, archaeologists study things like mobile phones. There is actually an archaeology of mobile phones, um, and a lot of people go to conferences uh, on the archaeology of the last 10 years. This might, of course, persuade you uh, that we spend too, far too much money on our universities. Um, but it's interesting, and it's useful, uh, and this will, in fact, be uh, the archaeological material of the future. Ten years ago, well, we all, all take our um, smartphones for granted now. You've been asked to turn them off. You probably haven't. No one ever does. Um, but imagine how embarrassing it will be that that ring that your uh, teenage daughter chose for you and thought was such a good idea this morning around breakfast goes off in the middle of the celebration here. You'll regret it. Um, but smartphones, in fact, dominate our lives in many respects. But what lies behind them? Let's set, step back a little bit and think about the ideas and the innovation. What we can now get on these mobile devices that we carry around is we can get access to all the data in the world. Terabytes of data are available for it to us through simple search engines that we take for advantage in thin devices that we have in our pockets. The mobile phone conquers time and it conquers place. What's more, and you can be scared by this if you like, if you allow it to, it will always know where you are. And if it always knows where you are, it will always anticipate what it thinks that you want. And that, of course, is the future of advertising, and that is the future of revenue being driven out of these innovations. But 10 years ago, they looked like that. They looked clunky. They're things that you wouldn't be seen dead with now, but 10 years ago, they were new. Go back 20 years ago, they were horrible. Um, huge innovation, things going on 10 years ago that were not imagined before that, and for which we're now realizing uh, the true potential. Now, well, what to choose now? Well, here's graphene. Now, I barely understand graphene, and I'm quite sure because it's conceptually such a very difficult thing to get one's mind around. Essentially, it's a single layer of carbon cells. Developed here in Manchester, uh, and very appropriately, uh, as a result of that, uh, two Nobel Prize winners to the University of Manchester, recognizing uh, the significance uh, of this wonderful invention. This is going to change our lives in all sorts of ways. Invented, of course, some years ago, discovered some years ago, we're only now beginning to understand exactly how graphene uh, will change our everyday lives and the devices that we use. And it will change it in fundamental ways. It will obviously change things like television sets and communication, but it will undoubtedly uh, change huge aspects of medical technology uh, that move forward to ensure that we have better lives. Again, at the heart of this, brilliant ideas perceiving the possibilities for the future. So there we are. That's my million-year introduction to you today. Uh, you've got some wonderful speakers who are going to talk about ideas and innovation ranging through from human rights, going into music, going into culture, and of course, looking at the future of science. But it's all about ideas. It's all about being who we are. And it's all about realizing the potential of being a modern human being that started 
in southern Africa 100,000 years ago when people like us first began to experiment with art, first began to experiment with ideas. So let me leave you with the abiding thought that in the very depths of your brains and the very depths of your imagination, you are all Africans, and congratulations. Thank you. <clears throat>